On May 29, 1997, Jeff Buckley, stone cold sober, feeling puckish and singing whole lot of love, swam fully clothed into the Wolf River Harbour. That's the last time anyone saw him alive. His drowned body was plucked from a tangle of branches beside a flood swollen Wolf River four days later. Easy as it is to consign Buckley amongst the burned brief but burned bright, and pay easy lip service to him as one of rock and roll's fallen icons, this is unfair on two levels, the personal and in terms of what Buckley's relationship to music time and place was, and the semantic, because Jeff Buckley was a long way from rock and roll. He was everywhere. The profound artifact Buckley left us, of course, is his only completed album, Grace. Released in August 1994, Grace initially received mixed reviews at best, with Australia being the only market to receive it with open arms. Every studio recording Buckley released went top 10 in Australia, nothing he released even went top 50 for the US. At the time I had no interest in anything to do with pop music buried as I was in jazz men like Johnny Griffin and Clifford Brown and Bill Evans. But I had a record buying pattern at the time, and I still do, is usually two familiar records and one random one. It's, it's a kind of OCD, I guess. I, I can only ever buy things in threes. It does no real harm, and my tailor is usually very pleased to see me. In any case, Grace, of course, was the third of that selection. Immediately I heard it, I realized Buckley had far more in common with Evans, Brown and others than he did with sad little boy grungsters or cookie cutter ghost written rappers. How he had more in common with Van Morrison who himself was going through a bit of a career rebirth or a pre-born to run Bruce Springsteen whose voice was a similar mixture of tenuousness and confidence or how he had the ambition to bridge Robert Plant and Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan. You could hear this and much more in Grace at the very first listen. So let's delve in. If this is your first listen, I would so very much value your impressions. The album opens with a swirl of accidentals and Buckley's diaphanous voicelessness, resolving itself into a near whisper for the first half of the first verse, then a keening ghostly whine for the second half before arriving near the top of his range in G5. Buckley, despite sources claiming a four octave vocal range, could comfortably handle G2 to E flat 6, around three and a half octaves, although he does strain for a high G in grace, and he did have a seemingly effortless falsetto. In an album, the theme of which, if it has one, is the blurring of lines between dreams, dream states and realities. This belongs firmly in the dream state in some half asleep reverie on a lover who has brought mystery, shame and dependence, which Buckley longs for and yet recoils from. I'm not sure that the lyric send whips of opinion down my back give me more stands, however, as one of the prouder moments to his lyrical craft. The title track, Grace, a much more straightforward song with the exception of Gary Lucas's Dizzying the arpeggiated guitar, Lucas is credited on the album for Magnificent Guitarness, stands out as one of the, if not the very, strongest songs on the album. A goodbye song crouched within a rain and the weight of mortality and undyingness of love. The chorus is his most explicit reference to Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, chanting, wait in the fire, wait in the fire, wait in the fire. Paraphrasing Rumi, the Sufi mystic, who, when asked what the secret of his life had been, replied, I burned, and I burned, and I burned. To cut a long story short, Sufis believe that a concept called patience in the fire removes away all of the extraneous layers of existence and facilitates a closer relationship to God. Buckley's vocal is spectacular, ranging from seductive to a mad desperation. Along with Lucas drummer Matt Johnson as the unsung hero of the song turning in a skillful, authoritative performance without splashing it about too much. Andy Wallace's production has its credits and its demerits. His use of strings is wonderful, punctuating the song with both drama and pathos, but the phasing on Buckley's vocal at the end is questionable. If not a career-defining performance from Buckley, 
then it's a career announcing one and was rightly released as the first single. Last Goodbye, one of the better recognised songs from the album due to its use in TVs and movies, is also the most conventional song on the album, insofar as anything here is conventional. Featuring Buckley's slide guitar, Buckley had worked for 10 years as a session guitarist before landing his deal with Columbia, and some once again sympathetic strings via Wallace, Buckley seems to sing this from well within himself, aware of the gravity of the choice he and his lover are making before loosening the reins for the last verse. It's all still very controlled, there's no singing for the sake of singing until the sad, final and silent resolution. Lilac Wine, a song made famous by Nina Simone, is a very close second favourite song of mine on the album. I'll go so far as to say that Buckley surpasses Simone on it. His vocal, a potent mix of his Eastern influences, Weimar era cabaret and Marvin Gaye style soul. This is late night on repeat music at its finest, as well as a piercing insight into the level of craft that Buckley had developed before he so much as got to a recording studio. After such a strong start, it's perhaps inevitable that there should be some dip, and so there is. Side 1 and Side 2 conclude and open with the two weakest songs on the album. So Real has two fatal flaws, one a guitar solo that represents the one genuine lapse in judgement. Perhaps the noisy out of place solo was intended to remedy the second fatal flaw, that the song is really quite dull. Now, criticising Hallelujah is tantamount to some kind of high blasphemy, I know, but Buckley's version just doesn't seem engaged with the song. He's so intent on singing prettily, he projects the song to the point where it has no meaning beyond a sonorous melody. He's also clearly bored with it by three minutes, but the record outstays its welcome by another four. Typical of its problems is at 611. Buckley hits the closing note which he holds for an astonishing 23 seconds. Then he tries to hit another one. He gets it, but nowhere near as cleanly or emotionally as the first time. It's redundant. He had the perfect ending, but he chose to oversing it, and Wallace chose to leave it on the record. The remaining four tracks on the album are thankfully rather excellent and very diverse. Lover You Should Have Come Over is another of the album's standouts, where Buckley starts to venture into epic territory here. But whereas the stadium rockers who would have covetously snapped up this song would cast their voices into the wide open bleachers, Buckley retains small club intimacy around his voice, casting his smouldering Romeo, a man who knows he doesn't have what it takes to find the kind of relationship he wants, but equally lacks the strength to say no. A man who wants everything, but knows what he has to give, carries no currency. Corpus Christi Carol is astonishing, breathtaking, staggeringly ambitious. Not only my favourite song on the album, but one of my favourite songs of the decade. Accompanied just by his guitar, Buckley employs a seamless falsetto to create a world seemingly not only outside the album, but outside of time and experience. Given that the song dates from 1504, it certainly stands as a step beyond the medievalist pretensions of some certain 70s progsters. When Buckley started circulating demo tapes in the early 90s, he would always include one noisy punk song in the hope of catching the grunge wave. The odd song out on the album, Eternal Life, seems like a toned down, Led Zeppelin up version of one such song. The lyrics are an incoherent ball of what we would have called, in those days, rage, and these days we'd call petulance, which is okay because the vocal is so commanding, so confident, so full of the spirit of the music, you don't really have to listen to the lyrics, just listen to the voice that's creating them. All things weighed against all other things, the only real issue with this song is that it probably would have been better sequenced at the top of side two. The album closes on one of its strongest songs, Dream Brother. The richest in the album's Eastern influences and its strongest lyric, where Buckley confronts not only his past, but his relationship with his dream brother, 
and warns him not to be the kind of man that Buckley's father was by working out on his family. Musically, the song is a reverb swayed mix of constant surprises, the melody a simple linear rock drone against a simple circle of chords, and a pulsing tabla until the wonderfully Beatlesque middle section which resolves its dreamy harmonies back to the darkness of the drone. Harmonies repile on harmonies, the melody reinvents itself subtly, and then, just like a dream in fever, it's gone. And he too, soon enough, was gone. The Wonder of Grace was not, however, just in its music. It was how that music, that strange, alien, yet familiar sounding music, swam against the streams of the times and seemed to reassert to those of us who understood such things that music has values, it has principle, it has a quantum of risk and reward to it that makes it worthwhile. The biggest selling albums of 1994 were Ace of Bases, The Sign and Mariah Carey's Music Box and in 1995 it was a greatest hits album by Garth Brooks. All albums, along with many others, which had been rinsed free of any sense of risk or ambition or challenge to the artist, which was fine for club hoppers or the little girls who like to sing into the back of their hairbrushes or the country than thou crowd with their shiny pickups and their hankin' and their drankin', but ultimately they were ephemeral products designed to be discarded in three years' time when the next album came out. Beats freshly tweaked, image adjusted, and intervening scandals all airbrushed away. Grace is not such a work. It sounds intimate. It sounds recorded in a small room with only some over intrusive reverb at points to cloud the sound. Buckley seems to be stumbling between that world of dream and awakening, closing his eyes and following his voice and letting it take him where it will, for better or for worse. And that is, and should still be, a comfort to anyone who values art above artifice, and who seeks the odd connections, formal and fractured, casual or coincidental, between artists and art. For those who worship at the altar of the album, and I don't count myself in that group, I'm much more of a singles guy, they can do so knowing that this was one of the last truly great albums to be released before downloading, let us cherry pick, decontextualize and pull records to pieces. And it ought to be treasured for that. At the time of his death, Buckley was working on a new album, provisionally entitled My Sweetheart the Drunk. Producer Tom Verlaine took some abortive material from 1996 and 97, as well as the four track demos and what little work the reassembled band had done, and an album based on that material was released in May 1998, which made number one in Australia. Beyond that, it's pointless to ask what would Jeff Buckley had done if he had have lived. Let's leave it at astonishing things and contemplate his one final marvelously imperfect statement.